Again, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And please is God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles." It's the word of the Lord. The great Anglican pastor, John Stott, he once shared a story, of course, years ago when he was alive, he visited a a church in the UK. He said that he sat sort of just in the back row of the church, and when it came to the pastoral prayer time, the time that we just finished here this morning, He said it was led by a lay brother, that is a non-pastor, because the pastor was on holiday, was on vacation. And so the lay lay, uh, brother prayed that the pastor might have a good holiday. He said, well, that's fine. And uh, he prayed, uh, you know, that that pastor should have good holidays. And then he prayed, secondly, for a a member of the church who was about to give birth um, to a child, that she might have a safe delivery, which, again, he said, is fine. That's a good thing. And and third, he prayed for another lady in the church who was sick. Um, And then he said, it was over. That's all there was in the pastoral prayer. He says it took 20 seconds. And John Stott, perhaps, being from London, Uh, betraying some of his maybe city bias, he said this, this is a village church with a village God. A village church with a village God. And what he meant by that is he says, they have no interest in the world outside. In their prayers, at least on that Sunday, with that brother who was praying, there was no thinking about the poor, the oppressed, the refugees, places of violence, There was no thinking about world evangelization, sharing the gospel with the world. He said it was a village church with a village-sized God. I wonder for us this morning, do you have a village God? If you take a look back on your week and consider your prayers based on the scope and the depth of your prayers, How big would someone say your God is? How often do your prayers make it beyond yourself and your family and your friends? I wonder even in our church here, our community, is there some element that that we have a a village God? Are we limiting God even in our, our prayers with too small prayers? Too small God. Well, in our passage this morning, The Lord in his word is calling us to prioritize and expand our prayer lives. And and not just individually, but but in fact, the the application of this chapter is is actually most directly to corporate prayer, when when God's people are gathered together in worship. Now, as I said, we've been working through the book of 1 Timothy. The this title of our series actually comes from what I believe to be the purpose statement of the book in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I, I believe it because I think it says it right there, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Paul writes to his child in the faith, this uh, this young pastor he'd been discipling, who had traveled with, who he had left in the city of Ephesus. He writes to him in verse 14, Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that, here's the purpose, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. As we're calling the sermon series through the the book of 1 Timothy, 
the church, the pillar and the foundation of truth. According to chapter 3, verse 14, that this entire letter is written to help Timothy, but it's also written and was read before the entire church of Ephesus and help Christians to think about how the church should function so that we might preserve and support and adorn and witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God has given the gospel to the local church, to the church, and and we are the stewards of this message to proclaim it and to share it as the church is the hope of the world. But as we saw the last couple weeks in chapter one of 1 Timothy, that this pillar of truth here in the the ancient city of Ephesus had some cracks in it. There is false teaching and an anti-gospel teaching. And in chapter 1, at the beginning of chapter 1 in verse 3, and then again at the the end of chapter 1 in verse 18, Paul urges Timothy to oppose this false teaching, to hold fast to the true gospel in sharing his own testimony, and to oppose these false teachings teachers that that seem to be advocating some sort of interpretation of the Jewish law of salvation by works. But now Paul moves in chapter 2 to instructions on corporate worship. In fact, if if you're looking at your Bible, if your Bible like mine has little subject headings on top, mine says instructions on worship. And, And there are some people who think, okay, Paul's done with the false teaching part and now he's moved on to the corporate worship part. But but I want to direct your attention to uh, the word then, or perhaps your version says therefore, the third word in my Bible, I urge then. Paul is actually connecting his instructions about worship, and in this case about prayer, back with his command to Timothy to, to hold fast to the true gospel and to fight against false teaching. So so the church's function in corporate worship here in chapter 2, it's not just sort of, okay, a book of church order and and that sort of thing. Here are the rules and things you need to do. But Paul is saying, no, I'm telling you to worship in this way in chapter 2 so that you might hold fast to the gospel, so that you might hold out the gospel for the world. So Paul, in the beginning, in talking about corporate worship, he starts with a simple command We'll look at that first. And then secondly, we'll see a specific purpose. The the, the simple command and then a specific purpose. First, the simple command is this. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, to pray, Timothy, pray, Ephesian church, when you gather together, pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. Now, have you noticed, uh, perhaps you're new here this morning, and you may say, wow, these guys kind of pray a lot. I mean, I don't know your background. Maybe we don't pray as much as your church, um, but we have a lot of of different prayers. Um, I I will say that churches that I grew up in, we often, in corporate worship, didn't pray that much. If there was a big need or a significant thing that happened, then perhaps the pastor would pray, but but it wasn't part of the, the regular rhythm or liturgy of the church. Prayers were seen more as transitions, or prayers were sort of set aside for a specific prayer meeting, where my church growing up was very fervent and gathering in prayer uh, meetings, which is great. But, but here at Ruggles, we pray a lot. And as I said, we've, we pray prayers of praise, of confession, of thanksgiving, petition, illumination as we come to God's word. We, we pray often for individuals in the church, pray for ministries of the church. We always pray for an, at least another church or, or ministry. We we try to pray about issues in our nation and in our world. And I want you to to, to tell you that we're not just making that up, why we do that. Like, in fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 is one of the reasons why we do that. And so Paul is urging the Ephesian church and Timothy to to pray all different kinds of prayers. He says here, look with me at verse 1. He says, petitions, that is, requesting your needs to someone in power, of course, to, to God who can meet them. Prayers, the second word, a general word, but in the plural, and most scholars think it's talking about sort of formal prayers that you would pray, kind of like I just did in in standing up before you. I I took some time to to consider and write down my thoughts to pray sort of in a more formal corporate way, prayers together. Intercession, the third one he mentions, praying on behalf of somebody else. And then lastly, thanksgivings, right? Self-explanatory, giving thanks to God 
You know, this can always also be our, uh, our, our songs as well as we sing thanksgiving to God. I and mean, I think about one of the songs we sang this morning. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts hunger for. We're just singing thanksgiving and praise, adoration to God. And, and Paul says that the church, when you gather, when we gather together for worship, he says that prayer should be our priority. Look at me again in verse 1. He says, I urge then first of all. Now, Paul had already urged in the previous chapter to stand against the false teaching, but as he moves into then how they are to stand against this false teaching, I don't know. I mean, the first thing that you might, that you might tell Timothy to do is you need to preach a sermon first. You know, you need to read some, some Bible. You need to read some Old Testament or some New Testament. You need to, to, to do some teaching. But instead what Paul says is first, you need to pray. You need to pray. A lot of people think about prayer not as first, right? I heard one pastor say, you know, uh, oftentimes we think about prayer, sort of there's a problem that comes up and you're doing everything you can, you're trying everything you can possibly do. I remember when we were trying to, to, to purchase a, a condo here in Boston and we were, went for a year and we, you know, we prayed here and there, but we were getting outbid like crazy and the market back then wasn't even what it is now, right? But, but just getting outbid and people paying cash and all this stuff, we're like, oh, what on earth? And so finally we were like, we've been looking for a year and finally we said, Lord, We've come to the end of our rope. You need to come through for us. And it actually was a miracle of a friend of a friend who was selling their home and uh, um, a, actually a former pastor's daughter here at Ruggles. So just a, an amazing answer to prayer that we're, we're thankful for. But I see even in my own life sometimes where we were doing so much and then it was like, all right, well, when there's nothing else you can do, what do people say? All we can do now is pray. But that's the opposite of what Paul is calling to us, the church here. He says the first thing you should do is pray. Make, make it a priority. And friends, I wonder how often are you praying? N not just on Sunday mornings. You know, I know it's hard to have, you know, the monologue of not just a sermon, but the, the prayer and you can daydream. But, but are you leaning in and trying to focus? Are you trying to say amen and agree with the prayers that are being prayed? In, in, in community groups, when you gather in community groups or in Bible study or in our seminar series, when we pray, are you, are you actively praying there? Or even as I was talking about earlier, is it, is it when you hear another brother or sister in the church has a need? Are you willing to, at that moment, offer a prayer for them? Right? Prayer is not just sort of an ancillary thing, sort of a cherry on the Sunday that the church does. It is an essential practice of God's people when we come together. And I actually just want to give us two quick words of wisdom for our corporate prayers. You know, perhaps you say, okay, Josh or whoever else is just up here, one of another member is just up here praying and I'm just listening, like what am I supposed to do? But, well, the first thing we try to do in our corporate prayers is with some exceptions, we encourage our people to use plural pronouns. So it's not just I pray. Sometimes pastorally I say I want to pray for you in that way, but, but usually we want to say we pray. Acknowledging that even if one person is talking, that we're all here praying and, and hoping to agree in prayer together. So that's the first thing. And you can practice that even if you're one-on-one you're -on -one or in a small group. Just, you know, unless you really feel a burden, I'm going to pray for this person and it's going to be my words for them. But, but perhaps if you're joining in prayer for something, I encourage you to say, we pray. We pray to invite that other person to pray with you. And then secondly, we often end each of our little prayers with the word amen. And that's actually an invitation for you all to say amen as, as, as sort of an agreement. You, you know, back in seminary, I was in graduate school, I wrote an entire paper on the word amen. Uh, I can send it to you if you want. Um, but basically, the, the word amen, all, all it means is I agree with what was just prayed that that is now my prayer too. And I would say too, if, if someone's praying something and you don't agree, don't say amen. Because <laughs> amen is, is a word of, of agreeing with that. All right, just some, some practical ways that we can participate together in, in corporate prayer. But all right, back, back to 1 Timothy. The priority of all um, kind of praying, right? We have all these different kinds, petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving. This priority of doing all kinds of praying should be done, Paul says, at the end of verse 1, for all people, for all kinds of people. And I want you to notice, and maybe you heard it when, when I read it, there's an emphasis in this passage of the word all. It's repeated. All, all, all. 
Now, it's unlikely that what Paul means, the Ephesian church, is that they should pray, or that we should pray today, for every single person on earth. I don't know about you, I- I've not prayed for all 7.7 billion people on the planet right now. Anybody has? Man, you are a prayer warrior. I don't even know that's possible, you know, to be able to do. I, I think what he's saying here in, in the context is-, is to pray for all kinds of people. Don't be, uh, create too much distinction in your prayers, right? If you, if you remember back, if you want to look back up in, in chapter one, the, the false teaching, we don't know exactly what it's about, but it has to do with people who are trying to follow the law, and they're looking not only at the law, but they're looking at myths and genealogies and things, and they're, they're sort of twisting the law into some burdensome commandments that the Bible doesn't teach, And so actually chapter 4 says that these false teachers were actually forbidding people to marry. It was saying that you have to abstain from from certain foods if you want to be saved and follow God. And so it's likely that these false teachers were were pretty exclusive. And they probably only prayed for for one another. And they were really focused, in chapter 1 it says, on internal squabbles, on, on myths, genealogies, speculations about God's word. And in fact, we actually even see this implied in the book of Ephesians. So the letter to the Ephesians was written to the same church that Timothy was at a little bit earlier, a few years earlier. And in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes in this letter specifically to the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews. So know this church started, Paul usually started, planted churches first with Jews and then would invite Gentiles to join. But Paul, in this letter, takes some time out and says, I want to talk just to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And he says to them, remember that you were once separated, but now you are part of the people of God. You are God's people too. You are fellow citizens of God's household. It's not like the Jews are, are better than you and they have more rights or priorities or that sort of thing, but you are one people. This wall of hostility has been torn down. You are united together. And, and some scholars say that, that it's implied there that perhaps the Gentiles in Ephesus felt a bit left out by the Jewish folks and that Paul, back in Ephesians, and then potentially here in 1 Timothy as well, encouraging the church to pray not just for the people like you, not just for the people in your sort of group, but for all kinds of people in the church and in the city. I think that Paul is doing a similar thing here. He even mentions, look at me at verse 7. We'll jump down to verse 7. He even mentions at the very last few words that he is a true and faithful teacher of who? Of the Gentiles. Right? So it seems that, again, we're, we're, we're doing our best, that, that there was some kind of division here given the false teaching was focused on the law and that Paul is the teacher of the Gentiles and he's saying to pray for all people that they're, Paul is saying to pray for all kinds of people. He's saying in contrast to these new law exclusive false teacher people pray for all kinds of people without ex- uh, distinction. And he points out specifically in verse 2. Do you notice uh, uh, one kind of person he points out at the beginning of verse 2. He says, for kings and all of those in authority. It's, it's almost an aside. Now, and I remember when Paul was writing this, a Christian king or ruler, of course besides Jesus, but like earthly king or ruler had never existed before. Never before. And, and in fact, the reigning Roman emperor at the time was a guy named Nero. Has anyone ever heard of Nero? If you've heard of Nero, you probably know his reputation and what he did to lots of people, but particularly to Christians. Nero not only persecuted Christians, he slaughtered Christians. He was the enemy of the church in the first century. And yet Paul says, pray for the kings. Pray for the king above you. You know, praying for non-God-fearing leaders, it really has a long history in Scripture. Uh, the, the, the book of Jeremiah, it calls on the exiles to pray for Babylon's priests, uh, sorry, peace and prosperity. And then later on, in the book of Ezra, he, he writes about the pagan king Cyrus, who God used to restore God's people back from exile in, uh, to Jerusalem. And the king, in his letter to them, actually asks the Israelites to pray for him. You know, probably the most controversial part of our worship service is our pastoral prayers. 
it's the time when we pray about some big things, some heavy things, as you heard this morning. You know, even though we, we don't have leaders who are trying to kill us, it's still controversial to pray for leaders and to pray about politics. We try to do it with, with gentleness and with winsomeness and with care. You know, when President Trump was in office, we often would pray for him and for his family. Pray for God's wisdom to be upon him, for his justice to work through him. Since President Biden has been in office, we've prayed multiple times for him, for his wife Jill, for his health, for his wisdom, for God's compassion and guidance to be upon him. And I know for some of us, it might be harder to hear about praying or to join in praying for one than for the other. And for some of us in this room, it could be harder for a different one. We may be on, on different pages with that. But again, we're trying to apply to, in, in praying for our leaders, even praying for the Supreme Court, praying for Congress, praying locally for our city council and our mayor and our governor, praying for both sides of the political aisle. You know, I encourage you, if you, if you are led and try to expand your prayers and thinking about praying for our nation or even the world in, in, in issues and policies and that sort of thing, I just encourage you to pray on both sides of the aisle for people. And it doesn't mean you can't have your own political views, of course, but, but it's okay to, to still pray that the Lord would, would bless and use like, okay, you know, if, if you didn't vote for President Biden, you can still pray that God's justice and his wisdom would work. This God's word says that the Lord is the one who ultimately appoints our rulers above us. And, and the same thing, if, if a Republican wins, or if a Green Party person wins, I don't know, you know, a third party person wins um, the next election, that we can pray on all sides. And so Paul says this to emphasize of first importance that we should pray promiscuously. We shouldn't be stubborn or stingy with our prayers. We shouldn't pray for people based on who we think deserves our prayers. We shouldn't pray for people based on who we think deserves our prayers. You know, I wonder and thinking about all kinds of people, um, who might you overlook in your prayer time that perhaps the Lord might put in your heart or in your life? Think about the homeless. You pray for the homeless? You ever pray for the homeless? You ever pray for, for blue-collar workers in our city? Have you ever prayed for CEOs in Boston? Have you ever prayed for your boss or for your boss's 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 boss? You know, the president of the, of the college or something like that. What about people with disabilities? What about middle schoolers or undocumented immigrants? What about that person that drives you nuts at work and nobody seems to like? You pray for him or her? You know, one of the beauties of the church Again, no church is, is perfectly diverse, but, but the one thing I love about our church is that we have a, a, mixture, of, of, of denomin or, sorry, a mixture of generations, an intergenerational church, and, and also an international church. It's, it's a reminder when you come to worship that, that not everyone is just like you. And even as you come, one thing you can do, in fact, I love this, that, that Linda, she's, she's with the kids this morning, but Linda, when she leads us in prayer, she often will say, which I love, I think I've stolen this once or twice, she'll say, take some time and pray for one other person who's here, or another church member that you know, and, and she just leaves some silence, you know? How cool is that? You can just look around and be like, wow, I never thought to pray for Yao this week, or I never thought to pray for Paul Chernock, but he's here, and I'm looking at him, okay, yeah, I'm going to pray for Paul right now. How cool is that? So that's a simple command that we should pray. Pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. But Paul also wants us to see why. I don't want us to leave here saying like, all right, fine, I don't pray enough, I'll pray more. Sorry. Sorry, pastor. All right, I'll work on it. And Paul doesn't actually want Timothy or the Ephesian church to do that either. He has a purpose for inviting them to pray. And I would say as the, a parent of a five-year-old who constantly is asking why, why, and why, I'm sure he would appreciate this as well. And so why does God call us to pray? He said, pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people because, secondly, God desires all people to be saved. He desires all people to be saved. That not only the connection back in chapter one to pray because it reflects the gospel, we'll talk about that, that you can hold fast, but also because God desires all people to be saved that we can hold out the gospel. So look at me at verse 3. There's a string of purpose statements here that we're going to work our way through. 
So it says at the end of verse 2, we should pray for kings and all those in authorities that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And, and in doing so, that is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Praying for all kinds of people is consistent with the gospel that is for all kinds of people. Praying for all kinds of people is consistent with the gospel message that is for all kinds of people. And it is a means, as we pray for all kinds of people, we remember the gospel is for all people, and that helps us to hold on to the gospel. And then as we are praying for all kinds of people, we then can share the gospel with them. Paul is saying the gospel is inclusive. The gospel is inclusive and it is to be shared. And so you should pray inclusive prayers so that you might share it with all people. Praying for all kinds of people, it helps us to hold fast to the gospel, to remember the truth of the gospel. That it's not just for the exclusive people like me, but it's for all people. And also then as we pray for all people, we're praying that they would trust in Christ and believe the gospel. So our prayers for all people, including the leaders, are ultimately so that the gospel would go out, so that more people would be saved. You know, I wonder how, uh, how often, you know, we pray for specific issues, perhaps, and politicians, but, but Paul says that our focus, even in praying for our leadership, should, um, and even for the evil emperor Nero, right, should be not simply that our political positions get adopted, but that there might be political stability so that the gospel could go out, so that the church can worship, so that we can share the gospel message. You know, Paul talks about here, he says, uh, he want, God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And he's probably thinking in his head here about Habakkuk chapter 2, where Habakkuk talks about the, that one day the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, this is amazing that God desires all people to come to salvation, but it's a little bit of a problem for us as well because perhaps you're here and you're not yet a Christian. You're seeking. Or perhaps, I imagine all of us here know people who aren't Christians. Not all people that I know of have come to salvation. Now, some people will say, well, of course, it's because we have free choice and God just limits himself so that everyone can make their own choice. But, but I don't know about you, that, but when I became a Christian, it wasn't about me choosing it so much. It wasn't like I was like, oh, I finally figured this out and I'm smart enough to get it. It honestly felt to me, and again, this is my subjective experience, like God opened my eyes he opened my heart, and then at that point, I'm like, oh, I can see now. And of course, I'm going to freely choose and embrace the gospel of Christ. It's sort of like, I really relate with Lydia in Acts chapter 16, where it says, as Paul preached the word to her, it says, the Lord opened her heart so that she might respond to Paul's message. In fact, the Bible is very clear that, that God actually plays an active role in our salvation, that, that he chooses us. It's this doctrine of election. And in fact, Jesus, right, right before he's about to die, he prays specifically not for the world, but he says to the Father, for those you have given me. So it seems like, for some reason, we can agree that God desires all to come, come to salvation and not everybody does. We don't know why. It's possible it is because of free choice. But I'm more inclined to think that the Father and the Son have some greater purpose for their own glory, who is chosen, who is given this gift of faith. But ultimately, it is not our job to try to discern that, to try to figure that out. That is God's work. Our job is to proclaim to all people. To proclaim to all people. And so even though God doesn't choose all to be saved, he has a general love for the world in which all people, all kinds of people would come to salvation. I love Ezekiel chapter 33. It says this. This is God speaking. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. And then look with me at verse 6. It says that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all people. And I think here especially, given verse 7, he's talking about all kinds of people. That Jesus paid the price for all different kinds of people. 
That's interesting that in this inclusive invitation that we're to call all people to believe in Jesus, that it is driven, it is powered by a radically exclusive truth. So look at me at the passage. You know the contrast. So he's Paul saying all, 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 all. And then in verse uh, 5, he says, for, because, why does God desire all to be saved? Why should we pray for all people? Why should we want to see every one of our neighbors and coworkers and colleagues and everyone in Boston come to know Christ? Because there is one. See that? There is one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, Jesus Christ. It's a radically inclusive invitation, inclusive command that's powered by an exclusive truth. And, and you, know, you might zero in on a few words here. The word saved, the implication that everybody needs to be saved from their own sin or rebellion against God. The word truth, that they come to a knowledge of the truth, that, that there actually is an objective truth about who God is. And that without the good news of Jesus, without believing in Jesus, we are not in the truth. We are living in falsehood. And finally, in verse 5, of course, one. There's one God, one mediator between God and mankind. Of course, Jesus said, them himself, said this himself in John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to get to God, to be made right with God, is through Jesus. Now, this exclusivity that we see here, it makes us bristle, doesn't it? You know, the first part about praying for all different kinds of people. Oh yeah, all people, that's great. People like that. But the exclusivity, it says, I don't know. The truth is, though, that everybody is exclusive about their beliefs in some ways. Right, right? For example, isn't it popular in our society for someone to say, um, it doesn't matter what religion you believe in, if you're just a good person, then, you know, if there's an afterlife or heaven, whatever, then, then you'll go to heaven. If you're a good person, you'll, you'll go to heaven. And, and that sounds pretty inclusive, right? But here's the problem. If you say that, you are still excluding a group of people. Who are you excluding? You're excluding all the bad people, right? You say, well, if you're a good enough person, then you know, you can, you can go to heaven. But you're still excluding the, the, the bad people. And chances are that someone who says that, they're defining for themselves who they think is bad. So suddenly, someone, what seems like inclusivity, it becomes very narrow. And if we're honest, our default position is to imagine heaven with all the people that we like and without any of the people we don't like. And that's pretty exclusive. And so what I'm trying to say is that if you have, first of all, if you have any sense of justice at all and see any of the, the harm that is done across our world, the results of sin, then you're going to admit, everybody admits there are some bad people, right? You can start with Adolf Hitler and then like go down from there. Like everyone's going to say there's some people that are, are bad people, that they deserve the justice of God on them. And so the question is, is who determines? All spiritual beliefs are, are exclusive. The question isn't whether they're inclusive or exclusive, but whether they're true or not. Pastor Tim Keller, whose book we give away, he says this, he says, all religions are exclusive. Even atheism, by the way, we don't have time for that, we don't have time, but, but Christianity is the most inclusive exclusivity that there is. Christianity is, the, is inclusive exclusivity, right? Christianity teaches that the only way that we can be made right with God is not by being a good person, but it's by receiving something we could never be good enough to earn ourselves, by receiving the forgiveness of Christ. It says in our passage that Jesus paid the price. He paid the ransom for your wrongs, for your sins, on the cross, and that Jesus rose again in victory over death to prove that he is really God and to show us our future, a day for all those who believe in him and who are forgiven that by his grace we will, in the next life, be transformed and there will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more crying or pain. God can really offer you eternal life in heaven. 
And so all you have to do in order to become a Christian is to believe in Jesus. If you want this eternal life, just to believe in him and to receive it. We are not saved by our moral record. We're not saved by our, our education or our marital status or our race or a specific political viewpoint. God gives salvation as a gift to all who turn to Christ and believe in him. And this morning, even this morning, if you're here seeking, you can turn and believe in Jesus yourself. In fact, in the back of the bulletin, there's a, a little prayer in there, a prayer of belief that might help give you language. There's nothing special about that prayer that you have to pray, but it might help to give you language or how you might say, God, I, I, I want to be forgiven. I realize that I can't earn it on my own. I want, yes, I know it's, it's exclusive, it's only through God, but this is the most inclusive invitation of all. You can do that this morning. So Paul says that this is why we most specifically, in this context, in the church, we should come together to pray for all people. Because God loves and desires to save all people. And so I wonder, church, are there people out there that you have been praying for that maybe you've been tempted to stop praying for? That you've counted out? I wonder, do you remember what a miracle it took for you to be saved if you're here and you're a Christian this morning? That it was not just something you could figure out on your own. That God had to do a new birth miracle in your heart. The same God, the same power, God's word says in 2 Corinthians, that God in the beginning of time said, let there be light. God's word says he does that in each heart who believes in him. Paul says to pray promiscuously, to pray broadly, and it will help you remember the, the glorious inclusivity of the gospel, simply repenting and believing in Jesus. And then also as you're praying for different kinds of people and for different people in your life, and you can share it. You can share this good news with them as well. So you hold fast to the gospel, hold on to the gospel. I think it's crazy that, that years earlier in the letter of the Ephesians to the same church, that Paul actually prays the same prayer for himself and advice the same prayer for himself. He says in Ephesians 6, he says to the church, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. See all those alls again, right? He's, he's almost like first time they choose a repeat of, of that. They needed to hear it again. But look what he says. But he says, pray also for me. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me that I would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I would declare it fearlessly as I should. And that's a great verse to memorize. That's a great verse to pray for yourself, to pray for our other fellow church members, pray for other brothers and sisters in your life. If the great Apostle Paul, the prolific missionary and church planter and writer of scripture, the founder of the church, if he needed to pray that he would hold fast and hold out the gospel, then we need to pray together and individually to do so too. Well, some of you know that um, Whitney and I had the opportunity to, to go to the, the country of Zimbabwe for uh, two of our members, Daniel and Katerina, for their uh, wedding, really a celebration of their wedding. And it was an incredible time, speaking of like broadening that all, right, and, and of folks that you can pray for and kinds of people and, and seeing the church and just the vibrancy of the church in Harare, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, but one of the things that I was most, I think, impacted by in the two weeks that we were there was Daniel's father, and his mother, they ooze out prayer and the gospel. And in fact, it was, we and I would joke because at any moment I had to be ready to pray because we would just be driving somewhere, we were on a hike, we'd go up to the top of the mountain and then Daniel's dad would be like, Pastor Josh, would you, I can't do the accent, but you know, Pastor Josh, would you, would you pray for us right now? As we're overlooking all of these, these houses and things, would you pray for our, our nation and, and you know, pray for our family and that sort of thing? Oh, okay, or, or it was someone's birthday and we sang someone in the family and so, you know, would you pray, would you pray? Always be ready, it, just their lives so full of prayer. And in fact, there was one practice. So this is, um, there's uh, uh, Daniel's uh, uh, mother and father there, and we're up on a high mountain. It's hard to see, but it's overlooking a, a, you know, a good chunk of the country there in Zimbabwe. And, uh, and they're, they're blowing this, this uh, Jewish trumpet there called a shofar. But Douglas, Daniel's father, he, he shared with us his practice of about once a week or every couple of weeks. He, he actually hikes up to the top of that mountain. He said that's his gym. That's where he gets his fitness. Um, but he says when he goes up there, he, 
He goes up there and he prays. And he prays, you know, one to the north, and he, he prays for productivity in his farm that, 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 that they have and, and for his bride. And then on the other way, he prays for the gospel to go out and praying for the nation. And so he has different topics as he prays north, south, east, and west. And it's just part of his rhythm to do that. And, and for him, going up to this high place, it just expands the idea of broadening his prayers and to consider even beyond just his individual needs for the day. Oh, I've, you know, he's a businessman. He's got lots of meetings and things to do. But, but he takes the time to go up and see bigger. And, and so actually, I have been um, really foolish. I just copied him in, in what he's done. And so for the past couple of weeks, um, on Monday, on my day off, I'll take the dog and we'll walk up. We, we live in Mission Hill. So I just like walk up to the top of the hill in um, uh, Fitzgerald Park uh, there on Mission Hill and... and uh, I will turn a different direction to just pray for different things, just as the Lord has led me. So, so I'll get up there and I'll look south. And when you kind of generally look south from where we are, it's like kind of the whole U.S. And then you can think about we're kind of in the northern hemisphere, right? So the whole world. So, so I just pray for a moment, just pray just for the world and for our country and pray for God to be glorified in our world and, and in our nation. And, and, then, uh, and then I'll turn again you know, from the south to, I guess this is south. Anyway, south, I'll turn to the east, um, which actually overlooks downtown Boston. And so then I'll just pray for Boston. Boston, for our city. Pray for justice, for equality. Pray for families and marriages. Pray against violence and for the, for the health of the church in Boston as well and for revival. And then, and then I'll turn to the north and generally the north is from where I am in Mission Hill is, is where the church is here, the church building. So I just pray for our church. Pray for our elders, for our ministry. Pray thanksgiving for our deacons. Just pray for, for people to come to know Christ through our church. And then lastly, I'll turn to the west, which is where I kind of walk up from, where our house is. And so I'll just take a moment, pray for our home. I'll pray for Whitney, pray for the kids, pray for myself as a, as a husband to grow in, in faithfulness. I think it's interesting, God's word says, a, a word for husbands to, to live with your wives in an understanding way. Uh, so I think that's something husbands need to hear, because husbands maybe are, are not always very understanding with, with their wives. So I pray that often, that, that scripture verse that I, I've memorized, and so I've been trying to, to do this. And then again, this is a recent conviction of mine, but I'm just bringing this before you as, as an idea that I got <laughs> in Zimbabwe that just for a few weeks now that I've been trying to practice myself. But I think my heart for you and my heart for us is I don't want to be a little church with a little God. We, we, we could be a little church, whatever size church we are, but I don't want to have a village God. I want us to have a big God. I, I want for someone, if they could see your prayers and to see our prayers, that, that the size and glory of God would be reflected in how we pray together. That we'd pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people, fulfilling the will of God who desires all people to come to salvation. Let's pray. Well, Father, that's my prayer. Would you help us to grow in breadth and in depth in our prayer life? As individuals, corporately as the church, in formal ways, in informal times, Lord, would you burden us with this call to prayer? And would you help us to see that in, in praying broadly, that it actually reminds us of the inclusive invitation of the gospel. And by praying broadly, it also, it actually helps to accomplish your desire to bring more and more people to come to know you. So it would help us to pray for your glory, for the sake of our neighbors, that more and more would come to know Jesus, to be saved, to a knowledge of the truth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.